Hello and welcome back to the Musings Podcast, bringing you your regular dose of science, current events and general nonsense. I'm Chris Clark. I'm Andy Roast. And I'm Dave Lawrence. And today on the show, we'll be bringing you our favourite stories from recent news in science and technology. Today, I'm going to be talking about solar cells. I will be imaging chiral molecules. And Dave, what have you got for us today? Well, I think I'm going to talk about my fetish today. Oh dear. Uh, <laughs> so what do I mean by fetish? Any definition guesses? Um, well, I already know that uh, there's obviously the kind of sexual one, but then there's the a collection, a, a collector of things. Uh, I, I, I was going to go with twisted and weird, but uh, yeah, that's uh, fair enough. Mine. Well, one I've got written down here is an abnormally obsessive preoccupation or attachment, full stop, a fixation, full stop. Okay. I believe that I am fixated and have an abnormal obsession with the human microbiome. I mean, I don't that know is, if there's... That's a dirty fetish. It is yeah. a dirty fetish. <laughs> I, it might be fairly unique. I mean, people claim that most fetishes that people have are unique, but there's probably a few out there yeah. that have the same one as me. Yeah. Anyway, so what am I on, what am I on about? Um, well, I talked about it on uh, Musings back in the day, when we were live on radio. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, the human microbiome, the idea is that we've got billions and billions of bacteria, ten times more of them than our own cells on us. We're more bacteria than we are us. And they all live and get along on our skin and in our gut, but we don't really seem to pay much attention to them in medicine. Or we haven't over pre- previous years. I mean, we've got all these things in our stomachs, and we just sort of ignore them. We know vaguely what they do previously. We knew that uh, vitamin uh, production r- relied on them. That was one thing we did know. But besides that, we, we kind of ignored it and just went along and be like, oh, we'll just concentrate on our own cells. Don't worry about the bacteria. We'll worry about them when they're being naughty, but, you know... Bad let's bacteria. just yeah, bad bacteria. But let's let's just not worry about the good ones too much. And then you've got obviously the you know the, the adverts on TV everyone mocks good bacteria. Yeah, the, well, the yogurt drinks that promote yeah. friendly bacteria. Yeah, exactly. But that's a that's a legitimate thing because we've got all these bacteria, and more and more science is starting to catch up with the idea that they are doing a lot of stuff that are keeping us well. And when they're not there, we get ill. And this is this is a big field that's being explored more and more recently, and. Uh, one company called Ceres in the States um, are hoped to develop the first regulated, clinically approved bacteria field pill. Ooh. I wonder how comfortable people feel swallowing bacteria. It's a pretty crazy idea. Crazy so idea. instead of having some pharmaceutical company churning out some like crazy chemicals that are going to do some stuff and alter some stuff in your body, you're putting in other creatures that are going to sort of go in and, and sort you out from the inside. It's leeches all over again. Yeah. But edible ones. Yeah, and very small. <laughs> In a way, yes, I guess, because they are very small. But they're, they're I mean, they're not, they are living bacteria, mm-hmm. they're things, they're entities. They're, I just envision this population of these sort of like helpers <laughs> inside us. You know, back in the day when, when uh, global travel was impossible and you'd have, uh, you know, you'd go like on your horse and cart if you're rich to the seaside and that would be your big adventure. These mm-hmm. guys, all they can see is like the next curve of the intestine. Like, that's, <laughs> that is the, the end of their world. They're just getting on. They've got no idea about everything outside. They've got no idea about the universe. They've they got don't. no idea anything outside of us. They're just in there. It's just a wild minding ride. their own business. A wild ride for bacteria. Yeah. yeah. But while they're minding their own business, living their own lives, they are helping us. Yeah. So what are they hoping to do with these pills? So we've got the science for a while that we know that there's certain uh, populations of bacteria that we need to keep us well. So the idea is that they'll find the diseases where patients don't have those bacteria, look, see if they don't have it, and then replace them by shoving them in with a pill, which okay. is absolutely brilliant, I think. But uh, interestingly, it isn't the first time the concept's been used of putting in bacteria. I don't know if you're aware of uh, how certain types of clostridium, I think it's clostridium difficile, mm. uh, serious infections of that nature, how they can be treated. Any idea? What, I, what might be a ripe source of bacteria that might be able to be put inside you in, in capsular form? Um, <laughs> I well, I mean, no there's idea. the yogurt he drinks, yep. so... Yeah, Let's think slightly less pleasant, maybe. I mean, um, I, I say this isn't used like routinely for lots of conditions. It's cl- specifically Clostridium difficile. It's used okay. regularly in England. In England. What if you've got some soil? Um, and like, you know, if we've got some soil. Soil's no, probably a good worse. One. Yeah. worse. Worse than soil. Are we um, doing fecal matter here? Are we, are we doing oh, that? Oh, yeah. Part? He's gone. He's got it. Oh, God. Third time lucky. <laughs> oh, it happens wow. currently. Yeah, it's happening. This day, today, out here in the United Kingdom. Fecal transplants. Dear God. That is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> 
it is a little unattractive. Mm. But with this new company and other companies that are starting up similar sort of idea, the idea is that you don't need to be eating poo to get some good bacteria inside you. I would definitely choose a pill over a, you know, a, a fecal transplant. I just want to say I hope I it's think... not quite as crude as eating a poo. I hope there's <laughs> some sort of medical, you know, sterilization going on. Uh, I just think that you came up with a good slogan there. <laughs> I did it. I did it. It was. It just came off the top of my head. It was natural. But That's like, the sort of brilliance I can create, just willy nilly. It's, it's probably going to be their marketing slogan anyway. You know, it's, you don't need much of a better one. Who for you? Great. So when uh, do we know when these will be on the market? Or? Well, they've just set themselves up. They've been doing the research okay. for a while. They've got that in place, and apparently they've done a small scale tr human trial. So they've mm -hmm. given someone a, a pill of bacteria. Um, but they've only just set themselves up to be like a company that's capable of producing this on a mass scale. So we're looking a couple of years, I think, okay, before it actually sure. comes in. Well, it'll be exciting for people with C. difficile. They it will be. They no longer will they need to eat poo. No longer will they need to eat poo. <laughs> so from one therapy to potentially more therapies that could come out of the pharmaceutical industry. Now, at the risk of sounding like I've finally lost my marbles, both of you take a look at your hands and what do you think a chemist might be able to say about your hands? The wash. <laughs> yeah, good. That's a good one. That's a good uh, one. I, I have quite sweaty palms. It's to do with the shape of Ooh. them. They're quite an interesting chemist. shape. Ooh. Mirror image Mi somehow? Mirror ah. images. Yes. So it's all to do with chirality, which you may or may not have heard about at school, I'm sure. Probably. Vaguely. Um, probably it was a pointless question to ask. <laughs> is that the one where um, you get the two, like the two ones where they're twisted around in different ways or something? something yeah, like that? sure. So your your hands are incredibly interesting shapes. Um, they are chiral, which means that although they share common features like four fingers and a thumb, and yeah. those features are arranged in the same relative way, yeah. they're mirror images of each other. So there's no way you can superimpose your left hand uh, over yeah. your right hand. I remember because, this now because they're a mirror back. image. Now chemicals can be chiral as well, and um, that is they can be made of the same elements, and these elements can be arranged in the same manner. But the chemical, the, the molecules themselves can be mirror images, and okay. so they're called chiral molecules. You might ask, so what? And that would be a sensible question to ask. Who cares? You know, is it just chemists that care about this kind of stuff? But actually, chiral compounds are incredibly important in biology, where one compound might have a drastically different biological effect to its mirror image. Um, so, for example. The different smell of lemons and oranges um, is actually due to the same molecule, but two different uh, mirror images, or the, or the two different mirror images of the same molecule. Weird. It is weird. It's strange. It's weird. Especially like lemon sweets are by far the best, and orange are by far the worst. Oh, controversial. Controversial. Ooh. I'm an orange. Orange is better than lemon. Interesting, Dave. In sweet form. In sweet Specifically form. Specifically sweet form. Specifically sweet form. Are we can I can I come back to you at the end of the well, show? We'll have a deciding vote yeah. right at the end. Okay, and, and also uh, listeners listening at home, um, you can you know if you've got a particular opinion on whether orange sweets or lemon sweets are tastier, then leave a comment below, and we'll just continue this argument. All right. So yeah, but a more drastic example of chirality can be found with the drug thalidomide, one oh. mirror image of which successfully treats morning sickness during pregnancy, but the other mirror image obviously causes horrendous mutations to the unborn child. So it's obviously really important that pharmaceutical companies can find ways to differentiate between yeah. different chiral molecules. But this is really difficult. So nuclear magnetic resonance, mass spectroscopy and infrared spectroscopy, which are the basic chemical analysis tools yeah. open to a chemist, can't differentiate can't between chiral molecules. It can only say that this molecule contains these elements really? arranged in this order, but it can't say it's left-handed or really? right-handed. Hmm. Um, yeah. And not that. tools that can, such as X-ray crystallography and chromatography, often take a very long time to produce results, yeah. if they can produce results at all. Because with X-ray crystallography, you have to be able to grow a crystal first, and some molecules you can't make a crystal. You can't grow into a crystal. Mm -hmm. It's very dull growing crystals. It takes a long time. And it takes a lot well, of time. Yeah, it's not an instant result. But that is until a collaboration between physicists from the Max Planck Institute of Nuclear Physics and chemists from Heidelberg University developed a method of imaging single chiral molecules. Those crafty uh, Germans. I know, they're it's really good Germans, with the it? technology, aren't they? Yeah. <sighs> and it, they do it by a really cool method. They essentially blow the molecule up. They blow it to pieces. So they, they fire this molecule through a particle accelerator and then, and then the molecule uh, 
flies through a thin diamond film. Okay. And when it passes through this film, the outer electrons are ripped off, which leaves the positively charged element nucleuses arranged uh, in a how they were arranged ah. in the molecule. And because they're positively charged, they obviously repel each other and like violently repel each other. So the molecule literally blows apart. They the researchers then place detectors around this exploding molecule. Or, well, they placed the detectors there first, but there's detectors around <laughs> the exploding molecule. They're frantically building the, yeah. as the experiment's <laughs> going on. Going, oh God, where's the other bit? Um, and these so these detectors detect which element hits them, and they can say that you know this is a carbon atom, this is a nitrogen atom, or hydrogen, or whatever. But crucially, because the detectors are arranged in a 3D kind of hemisphere, they can also determine the position of these elements. And then they can kind of like back infer the chirality of the molecule that went through the diamond film. Because they know where these different elements hit the detectors. It's mm. crazy. Um, so this is certainly big news for pharmaceutical chemists who can now determine the chirality of the molecules. But, and this is probably a controversial question, is this a triumph of chemistry or of physics? Mm. And we can, well, we can have the discussion here, but also, listeners, if, you know, if you're a chemist or a physicist, I would argue that it's, as much as it pains me, it's a triumph of physics. I think if we're talking particle accelerators yeah. and detectors, I think we're very much in the domain of physics triumphs. Mm. It's, in the it's in the borderlands, though, Ma isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, to, Mind uh, you that yeah to explain one, you're, you're doing the other. Mm. Should there be a victor, though? Can it not be a glorious union of chemistry and physics in joint triumph it probably could be <laughs> well i think it's happening it's happening more and more as we get smaller and smaller and we're looking at smaller and smaller details i mean do you remember i was looking at that uh microscope that was you called afm mm -hmm. um atomic oh, force, force microscopy. microscopy yeah so that again it's, it's it's to find out the chemistry but you're using physics you, principles to to investigate it sure yeah and more and, and more it, this is happening i think yeah. really yeah on the, subject, on the subject of on physics, subject, and, chemistry physics boundaries. and chemistry and bouncing particles off one another, I want to talk a little bit about solar cells because a very Good interesting topic. story has caught my eye this week and Ooh. that is that just playing, to, playing music to your plants in the greenhouse doesn't necessarily, it might make them grow well, whatever, but what about <laughs> maybe blasting out some tunes to your solar panels that are on the shed? Apparently, this makes them perform much better. No way. That sounds amazing. So, right, so new research from Queen Mary University and Imperial College London appears really? to show that cranking up the tunes on the next generation of photovoltaic cells actually increases their efficiency by up to 50%. Which is what? huge. That is a lot. Of, yeah, big increase in efficiency. Massive increase in efficiency. Are they, are they vibrating at their resonant levels? Well, we'll, we'll, have, we'll go into the science in a second, but first we should probably talk about how a photovoltaic cell actually works for our listeners. Um, okay. This is sort of a materials and physics -y question. And that you see these things on rooftops nowadays, they're in all sorts of things for like sustainable energy. And what they basically do is they take light energy, so those little photons that are shooting down out of the atmosphere. They're little particles of light, aren't they? Little particles of light, they come crashing into this solar cell. And what, what that is essentially is a, something called a semiconductor. Now, any ideas what a semiconductor is? Can somebody give me a concise and accurate description of a semiconductor? Andy, you're a chemist. I'm going straight to no, Dave here for no, biology. No, I don't. I go, go back to chemist. Go back to chemist. Go back to the chemist. Um, it's got something to do with band theory and orbitals. And it's not quite a conductor, but it's not an insulator either. I've <laughs> always just avoided ever knowing because I don't really get it. You see, I've always enjoyed the description of it's not quite a conductor, it's not quite an insulator either, because it's mm. actually not bad. So metals, you know, are conductors, or for the most part are conductors. They have what's known as free electrons sitting around. So you've got the main molecule and you've got electrons which are wandering around aimlessly. Yeah. And what you can do is you can send current by making those electrons all move. And because they're free, they can move. That's a movement of charge. It's called a current. Hence, hey presto, you have electricity. Oh, Great. Yeah. Yeah. Great times. Now, the thing with a semiconductor is it's something you can turn off and on. You can either let it conduct or not, and all you have to do is put a bit of energy in. So you put a bit of energy into a semiconductor in a certain way, depends on the semiconductor, you can get those <laughs> electrons to free up. And once yeah. you've freed them up, then you can start moving them. And that's basically how a photovoltaic cell works. Ah, Photons so come in, boom, bit of energy goes in there, yeah. suddenly that electron that was bound into the whole structure is suddenly free. It's free to do this thing, it's got energy, it's wandering around, it's aimless. 
And then what you do is you sort of get, you know, essentially what you want is a little vacuum here to suck it away or a little wire or something. Take it away from that and then you've got some energy, you've got some current flow. Ah. That's basically how a photovoltaic cell works. First time I've ever understood that at all. Really? (laughs) Thank you very much for that, Yeah, very good explanation. Well, the problem though with the latest generation of cells is that uh, electrons are set free only for a short time. Ah, okay. So that, you know, they can make solar cells already, they've done it with silicon. The problem is we're doing it with silicon, it takes ages, it's quite delicate, there's a lot of work involved, and it's really expensive. So they're trying to do these things with more organic things now, okay. so stuff that's materials that are cheaper and faster and easier. Like so they want to make bendy ones. And exactly, they yeah. want to make bendy photovoltaic cells and all mm-hmm. sorts of things like so that. So when they're talking about efficiency and improving efficiency, is that what they're talking about, making it? So when we talk about efficiency of a photovoltaic cell, we're essentially talking about its ability to convert light going in into electricity coming out. So okay. there's a certain amount of energy in that light. If you can get all of that energy into electrical energy, then it's 100% efficient. Unfortunately, they're not that efficient. They're actually very inefficient. So we need to find a way to boost that energy conversion. Now, the problem with these cells, as I've mentioned, is that when that electron gets removed from the main body, we want to take it away, but it recombines very quickly with the rest of the structure. So what they've done in these latest ones is they've made these tiny rods, these nano rods, so millionths of a millimetre in size, and these nano rods act as little conducting wires. And what they do, as I mentioned before, it's almost like a little vacuum cleaner. Huh. The, electro- the electron gets made and it goes whoosh, away into a different circuit where it can be made useful. Ah, okay. And that's the wonderful thing about it. And it's these little rods that actually make it work with the music. I'm getting back to the music now because we got huh. sidetracked on photovoltaic. Yeah. But the thing about these rods is that when they experience any kind of compression or some sort of mechanical influence, they actually create more electrons. Uh-huh. They create a charge. And that means that it actually makes it easier for it to conduct other electrons along it. So by playing music, which is a sound wave, which compresses and expands as it moves through the air, it compresses and expands the rods and allows them to conduct electricity more easily, which increases the efficiency of getting that light into a useful circuit. And it's amazing. So apparently the researchers say that ACDC and Persian funk are (laughs) the greatest ways to improve efficiency, and this gets up to about 50% increase in efficiency, which is wonderful. But apparently classical music is not so great. Oh, no. So they're kind of trendy solar cells. They're trendy they're, solar cells. They yeah. really stick with the times. Yeah. And I think that's, in, well, I don't know about Persian funk, but <laughs> I, maybe I haven't listened to it recently. Have you guys heard any Persian I funk? I mean, I can't believe you haven't been listening to it. It's a, it's a yeah. massive scene at the moment. Yeah. That's well, what everyone's into, thing. mate. You need to catch up. <laughs> well, if any viewers out there have a link to some decent Persian funk, I would love to hear it. Yeah, that would be great. And we could maybe include a snippet on the next show or something. If copyright will allow, I don't know, something like that. I think that would be really cool. Yeah. Okay, we'll try that. Yeah, quick. But for the moment, obviously, like, playing music at your solar cells isn't very energy efficient, as you have to use energy to make the music. Oh, yeah. So what they're talking about doing is, as this is all based on vibrations anyway, why not just build the solar cells on the tops of buses or air conditioning units where there's always vibrations and things going on? I see. It's that a clever idea, isn't you it? You improve yeah. the efficiency of that and to do anything apart from put it on something that's already moving. Ah. Yeah. Oh, are we hoping this music one's going to be one of the ones that makes it through the next stages of uh, development? I very much looking, hope so. Looking they're, likely? Still, they're, looking, they're looking to develop this some more and try it with these new places where they can start making, making the vibrations happen. Cool. I think it would be a shame to waste the old uh, ACDC by putting on buses. I reckon yeah. everyone should just be made, made to, to listen. listen to ACDC <laughs> to power their televisions. No idea. ACDC, no TV. Yeah, you, you have to have uh, half an hour of ACDC a night in order to be able to power your TV. Well, maybe they can mix it up with the Persian funk. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, that would be strange, but could could be good. So what have we covered today, gentlemen? Well, I was talking about the old human microbiome, my, my fetish, which I like very much, and the idea of giving people pills of bacteria to make them well. So Dave has a fetish for bacteria in pill form. Andy, what were we talking about today? I was talking about imaging uh, molecules, which are mirror images of each other, and why that's difficult and new ways of doing it. So Annie was getting backwards in chemistry, and I was talking about a brighter future for solar cells with a bit of Persian funk. And ACDC, and, don't forget that. Of course, AC. ACDC, how could I forget? Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to the Musings podcast, and we will be back next week or in the very near future for a regular dose of science, current events, and general nonsense. Farewell. Ciao. Ta-ra for now. <laughs>